There is an airplane. Harry. Come and hold. When we went into Aleppo at the beginning of November, it was me, Mustafa, the fixer, and Jim and John. We were really looking at how the front lines looked um, in the city. It had become a very entrenched war in which a sort of stalemate on many fronts. No problem. Are we going back the same way? No. No, no. Yes, about. And then I started having issues with my camera and had to return to Istanbul. So uh, Jim and John wanted to continue on to Idlib, where they also wanted to look at you know the front lines, the fighting, and also uh, John had to finish his story on his first kidnapping. So I decided to go back to Istanbul for that week, and they were in Idlib. taken all the back roads. The driver here has been absolutely brilliant. Um, phoning ahead to see if there are checkpoints. Um, going really slowly around bends in the road to see if there was anything unexpected there. Past one old army, a Syrian army checkpoint. At that point, I think a lot of journalists just shrugged their shoulders in terms of, well, we weren't really afraid of the bombs and the bullets, but we started to get worried about the kidnappings because of how many foreign fighters were there. Because there hadn't been very many kidnappings at that time, there was this false sense of security and just this idea that, you know, we could still freely travel inside. But I think when we started seeing more foreign fighters there and people being threatened and some people being kidnapped, but for a few days at a time, that's when the, I guess, fear started to creep in about, about abductions. Nicole was waiting for us to cross to Turkey to speak with uh, James, and uh, James t uh, told her we are going, we are coming now to cross the cross the border. Then she called me. She asked me what happened, Mustafa. Where are you? Uh, I'm waiting for uh, for you. I told her uh, they took uh, James and John, and we don't know where they are right now, and we are looking for them. There were, there were no demands, there had been no ransom calls. At least when someone calls for ransom, you know what they want, and you know that there may be a way of solving this. But when people are just disappearing for months and months and months with no news, it's very scary. The whole situation kind of fell on me. It felt that there was this huge responsibility for Jim and John's lives, and their lives were in my hands, because if I had gotten a call from the captors, I wondered, what, what would I do? You know, what would I do? Because of the nature of how they were abducted and Mustafa not being sure of who exactly the people were, some of them were disguised, the four gunmen, um, it just seemed like, where, where do we start from? You really start from a blank slate. It could have been that they were taken by a group that was just interested in selling them for money or by a criminal gang that was going to pass them on to another group. We thought that maybe Islamist groups were responsible uh, for either monetary reasons or political agenda, or it could have been that they were taken by Shiite groups that were interested in selling them to the government that would have imprisoned them. The fog of war is happening there, you know, like misinformation all everywhere, you know. I mean, like, I mean, I kind of stopped trying to put the, the jigsaw together, you know, because Syria is such a, a patchwork of interest groups. The 
the first, you know, 12 to 24 hours is really crucial. And so I think I jumped into this very systematic, practical mode. You know, I created spider charts and uh, other journalists were helping me fill in certain gaps. And there were so many possibilities of who was responsible. So, so many, many people, people, they told me, yes, we, we can help you and we can bring, uh, bring them. And we, we following them to, to, you know, until the end. And no one, no one help. Just they need money. Some people, they told me uh, how many, uh, how much you can pay for them if, uh, to bring them. They need the money and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they are liars. Maybe they'd been taken by the government, or was it criminals? Was it Islamists? Was it rebel brigades with an agenda that they would only come out with later? You know, so it was just really looking into a black hole and not knowing who was valid or not. The government didn't really get involved until about two weeks after their kidnapping. And even then, it wasn't really like they were gonna take over. It was just trying to gather information from, from me and my sources. But the problem was that the people they sent to me seemed like junior officers and didn't seem particularly gung-ho about getting him home. On the 22nd of November, they awoke at around 9 a.m. They went to the Storm Internet Cafe where James Foley Skyped Nicole Tung. They stayed about 25 minutes, then left the cafe in a taxi. Mustafa did not notice anybody following them. As they started to turn left onto the unpaved road, a silver Hyundai van drove up alongside them and then pulled in front of them. As the van was driving up, Mustafa heard John say, Oh fuck, don't stop. The men approached the taxi shouting in Arabic. They were pointing their weapons and shouting, Get down, get out. They held a Kalashnikov to Mustafa's head. He was made to tie John's hands. John said to Mustafa, Please, help. Not again. John Country's story is very unique. Country was kidnapped before that as well by this group, uh, um, which was not part of the Islamic State yet. It was a jihadist group. Uh, so Country was freed, and then when he came back to the United Kingdom, he was instrumental in um, a trial against one of the members of this group, which was a doctor. Um, who had gone from Britain to Syria in order to join this organization. Were you a part of any of the groups that were operating in that area at the time? I was not attached to any group. I was a doctor who was given protection by everyone. And for five days, I treated him for his injuries. Now, the reasons for his injuries and what happened with him had nothing to do with me. The only part I had, uh, the only role I had with John Cantley and Jerome Molemans in 2012 was as a doctor attending to my patients. Well, you know, what became obvious was that people um, in Syria um, and also in, in the border areas of Turkey felt that these two guys had been arrested because of what John Cantley told the police, which may be untrue, but that was the perception. I was quite surprised how, how it could be that I saved two guys in a war zone, give them medical treatment, and then they uh, get me arrested. But it turns out that these two witnesses never, never did give any evidence against me, nor did they even request for me to be arrested. Were John and James targeted because of the story? Um, I don't think they were targeted because of the story, but um, the fact that John by that time was a, a, a more or less well-known journalist, basically the, the risk for them was, was slightly higher than for, for just another journalist, I think. Assad's forces are 
currently in Idlib, which is only five kilometers to our west. We've been trying to get into Idlib for a few days now, but uh, apparently the roads are just, just there's no way, it's not secure, um, but we'll keep trying. I had a theory that maybe the people who were involved with John's first kidnapping and who remained in Syria, not the ones who went back to the UK, were responsible. And, and because they were quite visible as foreign journalists, um, spending their time in the Idlib region, the same region where John had previously been kidnapped, and then being in, an, in a public internet cafe uh, for three hours filing, you know, anybody could have done a search about his case and seen his photo come up on, on Google, which made them targets immediately. We've pushed in with a Katiba, with several Katibas. It's probably about uh, 40 guys here or so. Large area of open ground, uh, which wasn't ideal. Um, we've now got a motorway directly off our left, which we can't cross because it's a motorway. There's a footbridge, but they've got two T-72s right there next to the footbridge. So we've basically walked into um, a bad area. Um, so obviously it's time for tea and lots of discussion and where is NATO and we've only got Kalashnikov. But uh, um, certainly so far with uh, this group, this, this is going nowhere. It's 9.30. Um, so the best thing to do is get out of here as safely as we can. There are a couple of stories of, of, of them being recognized in Aleppo already, you know, like, cause, cause uh, well, in the UK, it's almost all over the news when we when we came back. So that's, there was a lot of footage about him, and he was it could be recognised. And I think um, there were a lot of a lot of uh, jihadi uh, rebels uh, from the UK uh, in, in Syria as well that they were in touch with their uh, with, with news from the UK, and, and it might well have been that they actually recognised him. At the beginning of November, John, Jim, and I, and Mustafa took a trip into Aleppo together. We did go to a front line in one of the neighborhoods that the rebels were holding. At that time in 2012, we knew that there were foreign jihadis coming into Syria. You know, we'd gotten out so many times that we thought we were going to get out again. And one of the red flags is just staying in one place too long. These very little calculations can make a huge difference. When our kidnap ended, um, th th there was basically the FSA, the Free Syrian Army, was, was instrumental in, in, in getting us out. And that resulted in, uh, uh, in, 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 in clashes between uh, FSA and, 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 and jihadi groups as well, um, among, among them uh, the jihadi group that captured us. Um, and that resulted in, 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 in some casual, casualties on their parts as well. So there were, there were people out for revenge, I think. Do you think that the, the men that, that stopped you, do you think that they knew who John and James were? Yes. Were? I, I think yes. I think, I think, I think yes. Because they, they took my ID and they, 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 let me know, they let me go. They said, OK, leave now and we will take this, these guys. There's people who say, like, why did he have to go back to the same place that we were captured? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, with hindsight, I don't understand that either. I went to the same spot, but the thing was, it was such an unremarkable stretch of road where they were kidnapped. I was able to find the approximate location where they were taken because Mustafa, our fixer, was able to describe pretty clearly where it had happened. We did a slow drive through the area for about five or six minutes, and the whole time I just kept thinking how bizarre it was and how unremarkable that area was and what it must have felt like for both Jim and John at the time. I didn't 
know if there were witnesses, and I wondered if there was anybody who was standing by watching what was happening at the time. Yeah, I just kept thinking how weird it was. But I think when I saw the place, I just had this sense that maybe I wouldn't see them again. After that, all the leads died away, really. I mean, like, there was no more information, nothing coming from Syria anymore. Um, they had just disappeared. Um, taken off the earth, basically. Jim worked for us as a journalist, and we were looking hard. I mean, we had investigators, you know, on the uh, Syria-Turkey uh, border for months asking everybody they could find, going into Syria, uh, talking to people there, and all we got was denials. And there were explicit denials from jihadist groups. Uh, they weren't identified as Islamic State, ISIS. They must have been lying, as it appears in retrospect. Just, I want to know that, uh, how do you know James, uh, and how you yeah, met him? I work, I work before with James. Ah, you are a journalist? I am not a journalist. I work many journalists. With whom you were in the jail, like uh, James Foley and whom? My friend, uh, please and please, okay? Yes. You want to come, you will come, okay? Y yeah, of course. I can help, help you, I give you a very good story, don't worry. Are they ISIS themselves who kidnapped you with the, you were with James or? Please, I don't want to be so please. No, but I didn't understand why it's dangerous to talk in the phone. When you come, you understand me, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. No, he's lying, I think. So when Baghdadi announced the formation of um, ISIS in Syria in April 2013, Amr al-Absi became the Wali of Aleppo, which meant he oversaw all Islamic State activities within the province. That was the province where most journalists were going in. That was the province in which most journalists and aid workers were ultimately kidnapped. There was a, an unbelievable spike in abductions from the moment Absi was in charge of Aleppo. Well, the kidnapping of locals became rampant right from the beginning of the civil war. Um, everybody was kidnapping rich Syrians in order to fund their own fights. They started kidnapping foreigners when, of course, all the wealthy Syrians had moved out. So at that point, the foreigners became a very good way to fund various organizations where we kidnap John Cantley or James Foley and sell it to another organization for maybe $10,000 maximum. Same amount of small money, but of course, different kind of people. هلا خلال ال 45 يوم صارت في احداث كثيره، شفنا ناس كثير بالسجن، عرفنا انه هذا السجن هو سجن الصحفيين، عرفنا انه هذا السجن هو الملجا الرئيسي لتنظيم داعش في الشام او في سوريا. كل شخص مهم كانوا يجيبوا عليه، كل شخص ممكن يبادلوا عليه بفلوس كانوا يجيبوا عليه. قطعتوا او مت it appears that at some point in time, the Islamic State decided that they wanted to aggregate as many of these uh, Western hostages as they could. Maybe they thought they would be valuable in the manner that they did become valuable. Maybe they thought they would be a bargaining chip in some other way. It's been suggested that it was a matter of prestige. You know, the group that had the most Western hostages was the most successful, uh, most powerful. And the fact that they made no effort to communicate uh, for an entire year, uh, you know, is surprising. <laughs> 
Ja, rot, ja, rot. Ah, ik kan het rond. Ik neem het. Ja, rot, rot. كان في صحفيين اجانب صحفيين اجانب كان في منهم الفرنسيين الاربعه اللي تم اخلاء سبيلهم كان في منهم جيمس فولي ستيفن بيتر وصحفيين ثانيين كان في صحفي عمر الخاني بيشتغل مع رويترز one of abc's uh, young recruits from belgium uh, bontink um, who I wrote about for the New Yorker magazine, uh, got cold feet on arrival. He ended up being a hostage of the group he had tried to join. And eventually, uh, he, w long after ISIS formed, he ended up in the same prison cell in Aleppo as James Foley and John Cantley, and a German hostage named Tony Newkirk. John and James told Yeyun that they'd been kidnapped initially by Jabhat al-Nusra and then they were traded among four or five locations before ending up in the hospital in Aleppo, which was under ISIS control. Presumably on every move they were blindfolded and all the rest, so we don't really know who, who was in charge of each move, but at a certain point they were ISIS hostages. That was November of 2013. Hard on that, we got the first email from the kidnappers. That was a, a watershed moment for us, that we knew that it was Jim, that he was alive, and that we were dealing with the people who had him. Uh, but we knew little about them. And, uh, and then they went silent within a relatively short period of time after that. Time is a, is a tool that uh, is malleable. You can use it for as long as you want. You can call somebody or reach out to somebody and then wait two months before you do it again. Or you can wait three months before you ever reach out to them and then an intense negotiation goes on where it's almost daily contact or a sporadic or intermittent contact. And all these things are tools that the kidnappers use and the more experienced the kidnapping group, the better they are at using any, any combination of these tools to pressure to get the result that they're looking for. The United States government will not make concessions, such as paying ransom, to terrorist groups holding American hostages. And I know this can be a subject of significant uh, public debate. It's a difficult and emotional issue, especially for the families. With the European uh, hostages, in almost every case, or in every case, their governments were directly involved in negotiations, may or may not have paid all or some of the ransom, and in every case, the Islamic State released the hostage. Killing a French hostage was not going to achieve what they wanted to achieve as you know, killing an American hostage. And because the US and the UK have uh, had also this attitude towards hostages, we do not negotiate. Um, the simple fact that some hostages were released and others were not also exposed to the world, the double standards. Those who are in the hostage-taking business, because it is a business, uh, decide they're going to go after the French and the Italians and the Spanish or others because they know they can get money for them. If a government says we will negotiate for the release of our people, then any terror group, not only in the Middle East but anywhere in the world, understands that uh, if you kidnap an American, the government will negotiate with you, which then opens the open season on diplomats, on international business people and everything. So the government must say, no, we will not negotiate. Uh, American uh, government, they are not care about uh, the journalists who are get kidnapped. They hate that no, let them do it. Like they are making excuses that they are, they don't want to uh, support uh, the terrorists. The U.S. position now is we'd prefer to do this militarily. You know. Black Hawk helicopters, Joint Special Operations Command units going in and trying to do rescue operations. But the track record there is not very good. I, I don't even know where they were being held when their final holding place, like, it, well, at least the exact location. So, well, Special Forces didn't know that either.
it's expensive, it's dangerous, and it didn't succeed. The special operations soldiers that do go into certain areas do engage, and the captive or captives aren't there. Was it worth it in the end? What are we really accomplishing? How timely is that intelligence? Is this new news? Is this old news? What are the chances they've been moved since you last got intelligence? Uh, what are the risks to U.S. personnel going in to try to effectuate a rescue? What are the risks to other civilians who may be in the vicinity? Um, you don't want to send in a lot of uh, special forces uh, that risk getting them killed, um, particularly if your information may be stale and the, uh, the hostage may not even be there. They pretty much knew that they weren't there, but they sent in a team of SEALs or whoever to, what, rescue them? No, I don't think so. They sent them in there to get their cell phones, to get their laptops, to get the files, to get everything that was there that they could use. And that's what that mission was about, if it took place. I mean, we were moved every two weeks to a month. And this mission took place months and months and months after, you know, the French or the Spanish, whoever it was that brought the information back that they were there, fell into their hands. Certainly a rescue mission is high risk, not just for the special ops guys, but also for the hostages. Why they waited uh, until July to do it, um, I think there's a lot of questions that I have about this. Why would that be classified as a successful mission? Well, uh, I guess it depends on how broadly you define successful. It wasn't successful in the sense of uh, being able to rescue the hostage. It was successful in the sense people got in and they got out and no one got captured or killed. What's your name? Jim. John. Jim and John. John, Jim, Jim, Jim. Jim. Marie. Marie. Teacher. Marie. Marie is in England Ma is, is girl's Ma name. name for girl. You're, Marie. Like, you're a big girl. <laughs> Marie was Marie. Marie was Marie. Mm. <laughs> Teacher. John Cantley and James Foley were kidnapped in 2012. And until 2014, they were not used at all. Then all of a sudden, they became a propaganda tool for the Islamic State, but also an instrument of foreign policy. They said they would execute Jim in retaliation for the U.S. bombing, which had begun a relatively short time before. They demanded $100 million for James Foley. Was the publicity that they won by killing him, which polls after the fact showed that this event was the single most well-known event among Americans across the board since 9-11. Was that publicity worth more to them than $100 million? I think um, whether or not they predicted the reaction would be quite so strong. From that point forward, I imagine they had very little interest in uh, in ransoming anyone, whatever they would say. Negotiating with Islamic State was unique, was, um, and never happened before, it was extremely difficult, because it was a new territory. I mean, never before had a dead hostage been worth more than an alive hostage. They made a deliberate decision to go there, the two of them, you know? I mean, James knew the area really well, and he knew that John did as well. I mean, that, I, I think they saw the advantage of going there, the two of them, you know? They, they thought that would be an even stronger team together, you know? You, you can't blame John for, for, for uh, James' death, I think. 
ISIS has released a video which is believed to show the execution of American freelance journalist James Foley. The video also shows another freelance journalist identified as Stephen Sotloff. An Islamic State member seen in the video said that Sotloff will be next. Uh, Steven Stoff contacted me to do some work inside Syria about civilian situation. In the morning, I go to pick up him from the border to inside to inside Aleppo. Uh, it was some people, three cars wait us on the road, and they left the cars and they close the street, and they kidnapped us. Once you're on the Syrian side and you get into a car and start driving, you're on a single road for about a 30 minute window during which there is no path but the one you're on. And everyone knows, and if someone calls ahead and says, okay, look, there's a timeline of like, okay, it's gonna, he's gonna be at this checkpoint in this many minutes, it's gonna be at that one in that many minutes, he's gonna get in to a van with a fixer. Everyone knows, like, here are the six or seven fixers that often take journalists from this checkpoint. Um, so, you know, spying on the fixers is probably a more efficient way than spying on the journalists. From the beginning, when I was in the, inside the car, I talking to them, who is you? What do you want? But they hit us. They hit me in, in, in the gun, and they say to me, shut up, don't talk. Also, I make that inside the prison. But they say to me, shut up, don't talk. On top of it all, we were trying to figure out what was going on by contacting lots of people, but also trying to keep a lid on it because um, the family wanted a media blackout while we tried to negotiate whatever it is that ISIS wants. Uh, or at that point, whoever took him wants. But we all knew it was ISIS. I mean, uh, yeah. Um, so that was, that was really tough. In the latter half of 2014, ABSI was in charge of ISIS's media wing, uh, and that's when they started releasing all the beheading videos. So he had, um, and the, the State Department has said that ABSI was in charge of kidnappings for the Islamic State. So um, it's unclear, surely there were other people involved, but he seems to have been in a leadership position at every step from abduction to um, moving hostages from the prison in Aleppo to Raqqa to later the media wing, which was really seeing the beheading videos. I think the Islamic State is, um, has taken, you know, their brutality to whole new levels that has never been seen before on this planet, at least in the modern, the modern age. So the, the, the remnants of the ancient regime, or what I like to call the ghosts of Saddam, are in effect running the show. This is why ISIS is sophisticated at the level of guerrilla warfare, why it is sophisticated at the level of conventional warfare, but most especially why its propaganda is profoundly clever and wicked. You know, the information warfare that ISIS brings to bear is one of their, their greatest assets in this campaign. And if you want to really go back far, think of it this way. The guys who trained up the Saddamists were who? The Soviets, the KGB. So they know how to do this stuff. There was never really any willingness uh, 
to exchange uh, the US and the UK hostages, as there was no willingness to exchange the Japanese hostages. The demands for the Japanese hostages were far too high. We're talking about $200 million to be delivered in 72 hours. That's impossible. They knew that this was impossible. But the propaganda uh, campaign was fantastic. I mean, the Islamic State got inside Japan. He conditioned a decision in Japan related to the changing of Article 9 of the Constitution, which is the article that prohibits Japan from intervening militarily unless it's under attack. Now, that was a key issue of the debate. This was something that uh, Prime Minister Abe had been trying to push for several months. So the Islamic State knew that. The Islamic State thought, uh, well, this is fantastic. We can use it for our propaganda. We can influence Japan. We can scare the world. And then during this period, the Jordanian pilot was also captured. So it started with me seeing the beheading of the American journalist. After I saw that beheading, I was just like, wow, like this is shocking stuff. And so I went on Twitter and I wanted to see what's being said and who was saying it and, and how they were justifying it. I started to draw attention to myself unknowingly. I had no idea who Omar al Shashani was. Could have been anybody. I had no idea he was the military commander of ISIS and, you know, everything that went with him. I had no idea. And I drew his attention. I put up a quote. Basically, it says, you shouldn't hold women and children hostage for what their fathers, their sons, their husbands do. It does It's not justified in the Quran, but yet they were doing it. I was basically going after him on that point. Not him specifically, just in general. And I drew his attention. And basically, in a nutshell, he said, well, what are you going to do about it? And I said, what do you want me to do about it? Hey, hey buddy, what's happening? Well, I got to your work today, huh? Yeah, selling cars, you know. But when you are coming to visit us, what are you going to tell your uh, boss? Oh, I have, I, I have three weeks vacation time. All right, so, but listen, then Toby, we have another plan for you. Okay. You know, we have many, many fighters who come and join us. Yes. And then go back to their countries, like from Europe and stuff. Our own people here who are watching us because this is a nasty game, you know? No, I know. But it's other countries also, but you never know. I got you. I understand. As you said, this is the beginning of something. It is. I am uh, I feeling we are building a bridge. Oh, Mark, can I ask you a question? Yes. W what's the end game for you? I always look, kind of look into the future and just see, like, where I see myself in five to ten years, you know? Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? I don't know now. I mean, you've kind of changed that for me a little bit. I, I mean, I, I never thought I would be... Where did you see it before? I saw maybe uh, running my own dealership, yes. But I Still I'm, you can do this. Oh, yeah, I know, but I, it's... You know, and that's true. I can. Um, why not? No, no, there's no reason why not. I am very good at what I do. Okay, my friend. I'll, uh, uh, tomorrow I go to the Sheikh house. And yeah, give me a comment how it goes. Yeah, of course. I t I'll call you maybe this time or maybe a little bit earlier. Okay. But okay. then I contact you. If you don't speak, we can talk. I can call you back later. We can speak. Okay. Sounds good. You there? Hello? Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Omar? Hello? Can you hear me? Omar? Oh. 
shit. Who were you talking to? What did they represent? These people here. Uh, you talking about the good guys or the bad guys? The bad guys. Oh, the bad guys. The leadership within ISIS. Okay. Um, obviously, ISIS is a hot. Bed. Sure it is. Okay. All right. So hence, hence my involvement with uh, Kayla Mueller. Okay. I didn't. This wasn't some fly-by-night thing. I just dreamt up and said, "Oh, I'm going to wake up one day and be a hostage negotiator and try to save Kayla Mueller's life." It's so far from the truth, it's not even funny. I was involved with the FBI, involved the entire time. They knew exactly who I was. They knew exactly what I was doing, and they knew exactly who I was doing it with. So. Do you know why the FBI was involved? Omar al Shashani was number two on the FBI's most wanted international terrorists. You know, that's somebody they wanted. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was in their interest to get as much information as they could, you know, but I was tweeting with Ali Zaki about Kayla Mueller. And who's Ali Zaki? I don't have any, I have no idea. I, I mean, I, that's a name, that's a Twitter name. That all I know was he was very familiar with who I was. Based on the Al Shoshani. Based on the Al Shoshani, this information that I provided to Al Shoshani, he was aware of. So you believe in your mind that you are in contact with the right people that have American hostages and that you, having gone through this very, still I don't understand it, okay. but you explained it well, of going through the proper channels and paying due respect that um, you've now been deemed credible. Yes. To the point that people can, um, people will deal with you. Yes. Okay? Absolutely. Okay. At the moment they said they were gonna give me proof of life in 48 hours, okay? That's the moment I was told to stand down. In your mind, <laughs> I'm about my mind, but JTTF okay. is, um, screwing things up. No. Interfering with your plan. Yeah. But you're pissed, aren't you, that JTTF is telling you stand down your plan B while you, and they're not telling you what plan A is, but that ultimately you believe whoever is plan A is going to fuck it up. Is the system and it's fucking it up. It's not. Agree. Okay. But I also agree in being pissed off at them. It also allows me to put them. In a bad paint that I can paint them in a bad light and still get myself closer to where I need to get. Yeah. You follow me? Because your ultimate goal is to get closer and to save more people and potentially uh, if she's if she's dead, yeah. to get Austin Tice out. Okay. And then and then the other American hostages that yeah. they have. Because it's not it's not over one. It's not over by by a long shot. No, yeah. it's not. And there I was warned by the people that are holding her, do not no FBI funny business. None. They wanted to deal with me. That was it. That's why I had such intense emails with Jeff Rising. Rising. This was sent February 8th, 2.07 p.m. All due respect, Jeff, stop being fucking hard-headed. I have myself aligned inside this terrorist group, and I'm pulling the strings on top of these guys like a bunch of little bitches. Now tell the fucking CIA to call me because they will never have the opportunity again to insert a, a brilliant mind like myself inside this group. Stop acting like I am not loyal to my country and stop being fucking stupid. Here are the new IDs for ISIS leadership. Notice how it coincides with my messages earlier. What's the date of that? Um, the 8th. They took an email out of context and put the meaning behind it that they wanted to fit so that they could get me off the street, so they could obtain an arrest warrant from a judge. And then after, it was almost like they'd done it before. The reading of those emails, mm -hmm. are, which you would characterize, as I put it to you, 
are taken grossly out of context. Grossly out of context. If I was to say Jeffrey Isaac was intimidated, mm -hmm. was threatened, mm -hmm. uh, felt threatened would not be a good word. I didn't ever threaten. I just said I hope he gets what what he's got coming to him. Meaning, and I meant that in a way that when I when stuff comes out on Twitter, it, you're gonna look bad, dude. <laughs> you're gonna look bad. Yes, but, okay. But I think there was a because I did read it. Okay. There was a dot 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 afterwards. Uh, you're reading you know the dot 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 still. I mean, wouldn't that... No, look all at all my emails. Here, look. Let me show you something. You, I let know, me show you how I write. You do a lot of dot, dot, dot. I, yes, I do. Every communication I have is but with dot, dot, dot. But you understand the... the. Don't read into the dot, dot, dots. The dot, dot, dots. Look but the dot, dot, dots are left open to <laughs> interpretation. I guess. I just don't... I don't uh, yeah, I guess. I, that's. I, you got to look at how I write. Look. The way it comes off, it's like this dude in Camden, Wyoming, Delaware is telling... The head of the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the FBI, how to handle a hostage negotiation. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. But it wasn't because of something that I concocted or made up. It was from dealing with this shit. And I felt like I had a hell of a lot better insight than they did as to what was going to happen to her. And ultimately, I was right. She died two days after I said she was going to die. First they said she was killed by a Jordanian warplane in a building that she was being kept. But now there was some indication they're saying, actually, you know what, uh, this American girl converted to Islam and we, we buried her with, you know, she married an Islamic fighter and we buried her with sort of the, uh, you know, the Muslim veil and all these things. What are they saying? They're saying uh, this woman who came over, saw the true ways of ISIS, saw the true path of Islam, converted, became one of us, rejected you and your depraved Western society, and then you killed her anyway. So her blood is on your hands. Also very powerful. Not everyone has to believe it. Enough people have to believe it. Jihadis believe it. They watch these videos and they're intoxicated. They're enthralled by it. The United States has billions of dollars for the CIA and the FBI and the JTTF and the NSA. And here's little Toby Lopez from Camden, Wyoming, Delaware, has an opportunity to get this girl out. So what happened? I don't know. I got put in jail. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, he's only doing this because he's a prisoner. He's got a gun at his head, and he's being forced to do this, right? Well, it's true. I am a prisoner. That I cannot deny. But seeing as I've been abandoned by my government, and my fate now lies in the hands of the Islamic State, I have nothing to lose. I first saw John appear on a, on a video. That was also the, the, the first sign of life that I, that I saw of him. So it was a relief and terrifying experience at the same time. At least he was alive, but, but I mean, what he was saying wasn't, wasn't, well, too hopeful. In November 2012, I came to Syria, where I was subsequently captured by the Islamic State. Now, nearly two years later, many things have changed including the expansion of the Islamic State to include large areas of eastern Syria and western Iraq. John Cantley appeared in a number of ISIS videos, um, effectively serving as a narrator, um, or almost appearing as a correspondent um, under duress. Join me for the next few programs, and I think you may be surprised at what you learn. Personally, I think they made 
John, the spokesperson for these propaganda videos, partly to make a mockery of him. I don't know. It's very hard to say the psychology behind all of this. There are people that are accusing John of joining ISIS. We just want to say to them that they should realize that there's always a lot of gun pointed at him, even if you can't see it, you know? But I mean, as, as soon as he loses his use for them, I mean, as soon as there's no purpose for him being alive, I mean, he's finished. So the only thing he can do is just hang on for, for life's sake and then do the best that he can to, to please them, try to bring their message across. I mean, it's, it's not his message. And in order for him to make it out alive, he has to bring that message as best as he can. Look at the care and the quality that goes into these videos. Way better than Al-Qaeda. Way better than Zarqawi could do in 2005 and 6. So, you know, I mean, it's just part of the, the apparatus. Cantley actually said in, in one of his videos, uh, he said, you know, I know that because my passport is a UK passport, uh, um, I will not be released. Uh, my government has abandoned me. So, you know, this is, in terms of propaganda, very, very powerful, very, very effective, which also means that they know exactly what's happened here, they know what we think, they are, because of course, you know, there are lots of people that were born and brought up in our countries that we've gone and fight with them. You now have 72 hours to pressure your government in making a wise decision by paying the 200 million to save the lives of your citizens. Otherwise, this knife will become your nightmare. What we're seeing emerge now, a jihadist civil war, a jihadist competition for one-upmanship and thunder stealing that is being played out in the streets of Europe. And the propaganda is feeding that as well. Ces trois attaques ont fait que de nous réjouir ici. Ce n'est pas un problème. Défendez votre religion sur place. Tuez-les avec des couteaux. Crachez-leur au minimum à la figure. Mais désavez-vous d'eux. It ends with him interviewing a French jihadi who has joined ISIS, who speaks in fluent French. And he says, basically, if you can't come here, if you can't make the, the hijra to join the Islamic State, stay where you are in the West and do jihad there. I mean, what more can be said? You know, this is not, this is an international campaign. This is not confined just to the Levant and Mesopotamia. Watching the videos and, and knowing John, it's, it's very bizarre to kind of connect the person who I know and also the person who's now on, you know, the YouTube video. I, I don't think uh, anybody's doing anything to get him out because uh, um, if you do not have um, the possibility to negotiate, and there is no negotiation at the moment, how can you get him out? Rescue me again! Do something! Useless! Absolutely useless! If they think that keeping him alive to make tapes that bring more recruits um, is actually bringing in more recruits, then they'll keep him alive. And the moment that they decide that he's useless, they're going to kill him. So, yeah, I, I, I hope he, he comes back one day. You know, but I, I, I see the chances of that actually happening. I, I, I think they're quite slim. And then I think he, he has written that as well, you know, like, probably won't make it out alive and uh, he, he probably has come to terms with that already. I was hopeful everybody come out because I was thinking myself I was in dream, dream. I didn't know this country will be like this.